wanting to hear the various views on, uh, one, the afterlife, because there seems to be the living indefinitely versus living forever. And if you live indefinitely, s you know, how how long is that and what happens, what is there to forever, right? Because when I was, when I was a Catholic for a while, um, you know, it's like if you do bad things, you suffer in hell forever, right? And that doesn't seem to be something that you can really put in. Sure. Uh, hi. Hello. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll my first, you know, point is that um, I don't believe in forever at all. The word is completely uh, misnomer. It's irrelevant. It, it's There's no way to prove it. So there's nothing forever for me uh, at all. And regarding the afterlife, I believe it's emptiness, blankness, nothingness in terms of our consciousness. I'm a true believer in just it ends and it's over. However, as a transhumanist, I can... Uh, I do firmly believe that there is coming a time when we will ascend and evolve so far that we will have the power to bring back um, the experience of that person, perhaps perfectly, perhaps so, uh, you know, exactly as they are that we would not be able to know the difference. And um, I am looking forward to uh, that moment in time. sure how to answer that. Um, I guess I probably most go with a, a Buddhist model at this point, still, still figuring that out. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'm not actually in <laughs> that second. Um, so, so that's more like the reincarnation until you reach the the uh, level where you get out of the the cycle of suffering. Um, then things are awesome. I don't know. I don't. I'm still learning about all of these. <laughs> so, so all right. I'll go with I don't know. <laughs> but that's that's what I'm leaning toward at this point. Thank you two comments on that. The first one is that um, one of my favorite philosophers happens to be uh, Zoltan's favorite philosopher, Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche had this idea of eternal recurrence, um, and he used this idea of eternal recurrence to avoid nihilism, um, because so often when we talk about forever and immortality and heaven, it's very escapist, and it takes us away from, from embracing life and being true to life, as Nietzsche would have put it. I share that sentiment. I, I fear that sometimes we put heaven too far away and, and make it too otherworldly and we're too passive and waiting for it. So the first comment then is that I think that the, the aspirations for life should be about life, not necessarily, you know, infinite, whatever that means, because that's a, that's a tough thing to talk about. So that, that's my first comment. My second comment is that from a Mormon perspective, Mormons have a concept that we call eternal progression. And in eternal progression, um, each one of us has eternity to become more creative and more compassionate, um, experience more things, um, improve more relationships, and just generally improve the quality of our experience indefinitely. Forever? Infinitely? I don't know what that means for sure, but it's a beautiful idea to me that I want to keep participating in right now indefinitely. Um, if I, maybe there would come a time when I wouldn't want to. I have no idea. But I do know that I want to be true to life. I, I disagree with the idea that death is required for meaning. I think change is required for meaning, and death's a form of change. But it's not the only form of change. So let's progress. Let's change. Let's evolve. Let's become something greater, more loving, more compassionate, um, more creative than we are today. And I think that's a beautiful idea to aspire to. No. Um, so, so far as I'm concerned, and this is, a this is a Mormon transhumanist perspective, not necessarily a mainstream Mormon perspective, spirit is information, and information persists. <laughs> and we may even be able to engage in something like quantum archaeology in the distant future using massive amounts of computation to bring dead people back 
at that big database of names that we're generating today. Maybe we'll use that and bring us all back, and we'll have the opportunity to continue to progress again, uh, enjoy relationships again, um, create again, and that, that motivates me a great deal. There's a passage in um, there's a passage in scripture that says we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Um, Seventh Day Adventists do not believe in a perpetual burning hell. The the references to hell Seventh Day Adventists regard as um, a cessation of existence um, in more of a um, euthanistic perspective. People who would be uncomfortable to keep living, people who would, they don't want to go anymore, they, they, they don't have a sense that they, that they want to go on, then they are as they never were, they just don't exist anymore. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists believe after actu- a very complicated eschatology that ultimately um, people who, people who uh, want to continue to exist occupy this earth, uh, actually this earth, and that the earth would be uh, improved that whatever geological things that represent scars or whatever we've done to goof it up with our lack of concern for the environment, that it will get redone uh, the way it was in an Edenic state. It's sort of a perfect park-like setting with plenty of wilderness to go to. And indeed, the idea that we will live in body form, although if we did die before this transition, the information that is us will be put back into a similar uh, and improved version of our body. We would actually live in perpetuity. Got uh, question two and then possibly three. Um, so this is an open question. In your belief system, in short, what do you believe the purpose of life is? And in your answer, how would that relate to transhumanism or becoming a cyborg or anything to do with humans and advanced technology? Well, for any of you who have (laughs) read my novel, you know that this is one of the most challenging questions I uh, propose in the book because I uh, take on a a very controversial um, ideology with it. I think um, we are all on the path towards becoming as powerful as we can be, and I call this the omnipotender, uh, one who contends for omnipotence or all power. And I believe that one entity will eventually reach that and become uh, everything. And I think that we were all coded, or mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, as my philosophy, Teth goes, teleological, egocentric functionalism, which is explained in detail in the book. Um, we are designed to try to, uh, each one of us, accomplish that. In fact, if each one of us had that opportunity to do it right now, I bet many of us would choose to press a big giant red button and become as powerful as we could be. Um, and I believe that life is, is essentially just our, uh, the playing field for all of us trying to arrive at that spot. And uh, the controversy arises from the fact that it's impossible that everyone will make. In fact, I'd probably tend to believe, as the book points out, to great controversy, um, only one person will eventually arrive at that. But that's what I think the, l- the meaning of life is, is to achieve that ultimate state of power. Okay, so I'm somewhat similar on this, except that I think there is actually room for everyone to reach their potential. (laughs) So I think reaching a state where you reach your own ultimate power and everyone else does is an ideal that we're aiming toward. The the um, example, the Christian example of Jesus Christ glorified as a creative and compassionate being who invites us to become one in that creative and compassionate act is, um, so far as I'm concerned, what the purpose of life, one way of describing the pur- purpose of life. We could also talk about it in, in more secular terms. We could say that pursuing a radical flourishing in compassion and creation would be the purpose of life. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it in lots of ways. Um, I'm a Mormon, so I, you know, the one that goes back to my youth and my education, my upbringing, um, is the Mormon expression of it. But what, I, but what I see as purpose in life is the life itself. Um, and it's going to be painful and hard and difficult and suffering sometimes. Um, it is for every one of us. But I think that there's also an opportunity in, the, in those difficulties to learn 
how to maybe detach from our own egotism, as, as some of my Buddhist friends have taught me, um, and maybe opportunities to console and heal each other and learn compassion, as Christians often focus on. And, and it just, it's worth doing. When, we, when, when those things happen in life, those are, what, those are the things that make life worth doing. And I'm, I'm, not in a, in, I'm not in a hurry to end that. I'm actually in a hurry to make that you know, even better. And technology can help us make it better. Facebook connects me with people that I never would have been able to be friends with before. It also, unfortunately, connects people that like to send me hate mail. And so technology is not good or evil. It's just opportunity. And it can be risky, it can, it can be terrible, and it can be wonderful, and we have to shape that, and we're all involved in that. So the purpose for me is compassion and creation. Uh, there's a passage in, the, in John where Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I believe that Seventh-day Adventists um, uh, embrace that passage as, as uh, a mission statement um, in terms of looking at what our purpose would be in perpetuity, uh, the, the, the model that is narrated really involves um, maximized freedom, the least constraint, uh, freedom to be creative, um, something that we regard as an explanation for how there could, in fact, be an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving uh, entity. And then we see babies born with spina bifida, for instance. Um, the, the real atheist maker question I think Seventh-day Adventists have a real uh, powerful narrative that involves a God who would not, uh, in not be willing to curtail the freedom of, of creatures. And so whatever it took to get to the point where bliss was voluntary and community was spontaneous, uh, it would be worth it in a sort of uh, balance sheet method comparing the amount of positive sensation and joy and the like uh, against suffering, which if the other was perpetuated forever, then any finite amount of suffering would be outweighed. Question here in the front. This is for one panelist or many. This is uh, for Robert. Yeah. Uh, could you just elaborate a little bit on your kind of the idea of uh, death and resurrection in the tradition? Because it sounds like you're saying that if if uh, a body dies, a person dies, they, they, they cease to exist. But because there is no ghost or spirit or mind or consciousness that's separate from all that, somehow the machinery sort of makes it in some sense. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you could perfectly record that and recreate it with a technology or God could do it, then that, that's, that leaves open that, that kind of whole idea of there's, there's no speculation I'm aware of in this in Seventh-day Adventist theology to discuss mechanism, um, just agency. And so by whatever means, which is assumed to be beyond our ability to, to conceive, that uh, there would be infinite intelligence, and infinite intelligence would also involve informa uh, information, all information is permanent. And if there is a God that has infinite dimensionality, then that God exists at all points in time and dimensions we cannot conceive of. Very, very uh, compatible with just beyond string theory, I suppose. Um, there's passages that confuse tenses of verb in scripture, like before Abraham was, I am. Um, and the I am in Hebrew, even I've seen some commentators suggest that the, there's a confusion of tense to the point that it might best be translated when, when Moses asked for God's name. I am the always having been will being. That there's a sense that this transcendence of time would mean uh, omnipresence in all dimensions. So when we would be reconstituted, it would, it would just be whoever created the thing in the first place just puts it back together. They know the formula. They know the, the specs. S send it to the, to, the, to the Theo printer, I guess. <laughs> And then all that is that person's character and memories as they survive would be placed in that person. However, interestingly, in speculating on the notion, people uh, telling the narrative, in, and, and there's something in Ellen G. White's writings to suggest that eons into eternity, uh, while we're free to remember things, we're still going to be biological entities, and we may be finding ourselves saying, 
while we're fellowshipping. Do you recall much about that? Uh, not so much anymore. It's just kind of faded by the, the glory. There's a passage in scripture that says, at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. There's another that says, I hath not seen nor ear heard the glories which shall be revealed in us. This is sort of exultancy and bliss in who we really are. Yeah, I guess the one I'm after is more, so in, in, the, in the way, I'm, at least I think I'm hearing you say it, is that theoretically if we had the technology, yeah, okay. We'll hold it for later. Yeah, I, I was just curious. Uh, I had a question. Um, do you ever think, because this is what I often think, uh, neuroscientists are kind of, they're coming, kind of coming to a, a conclusion that religious brains are different than non-religious brains, like that they're actually wired differently and they, different parts of the brain activate differently in religious brains and fundamentalist brains and, and people that are sort of like in between like me, like doubt her brains. So do you ever wonder if all of this is, sort of predetermined, like sort of neurologically, genetically predetermined and that we're all just sort of talking about how our own brain thinks about anything and there's, there's actually no truth other than the way that your own brain perceives the truth. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? <coughs> because that's, that's actually what I believe and that all of this discussion is, predetermined. it's just predetermined, yeah. right. And we don't actually even have any kind of free will about changing our opinion. Go ahead. Well, I, I definitely believe in free will. I think uh, the complications and the complexity of uh, the mind and uh, just experience from the past um, and just basically look at a string theory and some of the some quantum mechanics, it allows for that to occur. But regarding religion, I tend to see it as something that is more built into the way we develop culturally and something through our past history, and we are slowly discarding pieces of religion as uh, civilization uh, evolves and matures, and we're coming towards uh, concepts that are not needing any of those kind of, uh, I don't want to say straw puppets, but I'm going to, uh, sort of straw puppets in our mind, the idiosyncrasies that we have just to get along, and, and, this, and just the, the, the strong bond that we have from history. It's very difficult to imagine ourselves outside of all the things we've learned. And unfortunately, the way it works, uh, going, I, I, I discuss this at length in my book, it's called you know, baggage theory, which is that we just carry all this stuff again and again from ourselves. And if we could start over, we would start over with whatever other baggage we carried. It's really a baggage culture. And I think the goal moving forward with transhumanism and also with just looking at religious uh, ideologies and stuff like that is to try to carry as little irrational baggage as possible that is in the benefit of the, the human race and hopefully the transhumanist race moving forward. So I have a, a couple thoughts on this. Uh, one is I remember there was a study about taxi drivers where they had a very enlarged portion of their brain from learning all the streets. We Hippocampus. Do. Yeah. So, so so it's it does seem like that can change over time depending on I mean I don't know if like the religious part of your brain could get larger or smaller depending on what you're doing so that's one thought that comes to mind as far as that goes um, another thought that comes to mind is I had experiences of you know feeling like I found God or things like that uh, when I was an atheist um, and, you know, it, it was interesting at the time. It was just like, oh, I, that part of my brain must be turned on. I guess I'm, you know, isn't it interesting to observe? So, like, it didn't actually affect me at all at that time. Um, I figure that's worth putting out there for what it's worth. I don't think that our conscious mind is merely epiphenomenal, that it's just kind of a, an, a, an experience that we have while our body and environment are determining everything. I actually think that our conscious mind 
can influence our anatomy and our in environment, but I also don't think that it's purely in control. I think that our environment and our anatomy, are, there's intelligence built into my body. Somebody was talking about that earlier. There's mechanisms built into my body, built into my unconscious, subconscious brain and mind that also inform my consciousness. So what I see us in is a really complex feedback loop between consciousness and what isn't part of my consciousness and between each other, the world. And is it an infinite feedback loop? Is it a closed deterministic system? I can't answer that question. I don't know if anybody can, but I think that it's not very practical to go around assuming that I can't influence the world to be more how I desire it to be, to be and to be in hopefully in a compassionate way. I think that the talk we heard earlier about where you focus matters because it influences the world. I think that's exactly right. I could be wrong though, but I don't think it's very practical to assume I'm wrong. I think it's most practical, I'm a pragmatist, and another one of my favorite philosophers is William James. So I think that we should act as if we can influence the world for the better, and even if we're wrong, who cares? There's a certain, um, th there's a certain Pascal's wager in what you said. Um, just in case, maybe we should do that. I agree with what you said, Zoltan, about, um, about some of the, the, the frontier science as it is suggested. If you want to read more about it, I'd suggest Je Jeffrey Swar Schwartz's book. Uh, he's a UCLA uh, psychiatrist um, and dabbles in neurology speculation called Mind and Brain. That's worth, that's worth it. Also, Kaku's book that just came out, I think, in January uh, about the, uh, the brain. Uh, he addresses some of that. You might zero in on the quantum Zeno effect as one area to, uh, to pursue. Um, I, believe that, I believe that that is a question that religionists have argued in terms of predestination and free will and that sort of thing violently and with death. Um, but right now we have the ability to, we have the ability possibly to do things that make a difference because of that. Um, in the past, we were left simply with, well, should we hold anybody accountable for their, for their morals? In fact, the quantum Zeno effect uh, overlays with some recent imaging study that shows that we might actually have um, a, just a, a deluge of potential ideas that are, that are rifling through parts of our brain all, all at once, and that when we lock something in, we don't really have a possibility, according to that brain imaging, which is parametric, um, and, and assumes we only function on a time t with time zero, but it suggests we might have won't power. We might have the ability to say no to an infinite, nearly infinite number of things and then just sort of let the ones by that we, that we can. Anyway, the delays in decision-making imaging appear that's a possibility. Okay, great.